Thank you, Hassan. Uh, good evening <coughs> to you all. <coughs> and indeed, uh, this is the second anniversary of, uh, of the Center for uh, Palestine Studies, and we launched the Center in this very room two years ago, and I'm sure uh, quite, quite uh, a few among you were already at that, at that meeting, and thank you all for coming this, this evening. Uh, well, we have the, the, the honor and privilege of uh, uh, having uh, Professor Khalidi as our first uh, speaker for this uh, uh, annual lecture series, which we intend as a prestigious uh, uh, um, annual event, which will try to coincide more or less with the anniversary, which is early March, of, uh, of the launch of the Center for Palestine Studies. So before uh, uh, giving the floor to our speaker and uh, introducing him, let me uh, just uh, speak of uh, some of what we have uh, accomplished or are in the process of accomplishing uh, when it comes to the, uh, the Center. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this, this uh, is an initiative which uh, started uh, and uh, is still functioning with uh, uh, zero funds, practically, except the help that we get from the London Middle East Institute uh, and the administrative uh, help uh, in that regard. But otherwise, uh, we have plenty of projects and our next, uh, next phase will be to, to try to get uh, proper funding for, for the number of projects that we have. But we have nevertheless, over these two years, I think managed to uh, achieve uh, uh, quite uh, a few results. Uh, and I will describe them uh, quite briefly to give you an idea of, of what is uh, going on. Uh, uh, one of the f first initiatives that uh, um, we managed to realize was a, a Palestine research seminar. Uh, which include the PhD students working on, uh, on Palestine. And uh, SOAS is such uh, a, a center of, for Middle East studies that there are quite a few and uh, uh, quite uh, brilliant, actually, uh, PhD students working on issues directly related to, uh, to, to Palestine. So for the second year this year, this started last year, and this year for the second year, this seminar has been uh, functioning. So this is one of the first achievement of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the center. Another achievement or uh, uh, another project which is in the process of, uh, of, uh, of being uh, uh, realized is to remain in the academic sphere or the directly academic sphere, the teaching sphere if you want, is the, uh, the fact that we, as a center, we contributed in uh, setting up an MA in Palestine Studies, uh, which to my knowledge will be the, the, the first uh, with this kind of designation, at least in the, in the Western world. Uh, um, and that would include, I mean, as a core course, a course in Palestine Studies, which will be open to students in various departments at SOAS. And I think this is an important, uh, uh, quite important uh, achievement that uh, we are in the process of, uh, of fine tuning and formalizing and going through the procedures needed for, for such, uh, uh, such uh, initiatives. Uh, I should mention also that uh, the Department of Media Studies, which is uh, headed by uh, one of the board members of, of the center, Dina Matar, uh, Dina is here, Dr. Matar uh, has also uh, created a course on Palestine and uh, the moving, moving image and is working on a Palestine Film Club here uh, at SOAS. This is also an opportunity to say that we are seeking a closer collaboration with the Palestine Film Festival, which uh, is already an institution here uh, at, uh, at London. Uh, then the, 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 the next uh, uh, achievement, and I consider this as a really important one, as the rest is, of course, but um, uh, I'm stressing the importance of each of these achievements, actually is uh, the, the fact that uh, we are about to uh, launch officially a call for manuscript for a new book series. We have an agreement, we are uh, finalizing an agreement with uh, I.B. Torres, uh, the, the, the founder and director 
of which is here, Mr. Uh, Iraj Bagherzadeh, uh, and we will launch a, a, a series called uh, the SOAS Palestine Studies uh, series, which will be a peer-reviewed academic uh, uh, publishing uh, project, uh, open to, to, you know, who, I mean, open to, to everybody, it's not uh, restricted to SOAS in any way, it will just be uh, something which is run by the Center for Palestine Studies as the key editor of, uh, of, uh, of the series. Um, then we have further projects and the, the, the next uh, big projects, let um, me speak now for, for the future, is uh, uh, to uh, set up uh, an international association uh, uh, for Palestine studies uh, with the idea of convening uh, every two years here in London uh, a conference, an international conference of Palestine studies, which would be a major contribution in putting Palestine studies very much on the map of, uh, of the academia and the Western academia and the global academia. Uh, and I think this is very important. For, for the time being, there are just uh, three Palestine Studies Center, one in Exeter, and one of the founders of which is here, Dr. Ghada Karmi. Uh, there's, of course, the Columbia uh, uh, Palestine uh, Studies Center and uh, our center here uh, at, uh, at, uh, at SOAS. And, well, last but, but not least, or actually what I started with, the, the, the uh, annual lectures uh, series, which we're uh, uh, starting uh, um, this, uh, this year. And uh, we have, as I said, the, the great uh, honor and, and privilege of, of, of starting it with, uh, with Professor Walid Khalidi, but I, I should say, who better than uh, Professor Khalidi could uh, start such uh, a series? I mean, Professor Khalidi is, is definitely, uh, uh, let's say, the, the dean or in some way even the founder of Palestine studies, if we're speaking of, of, uh, of scientific uh, study of the, of, of the, the question of, uh, of Palestine. He definitely is uh, the, 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 the main pillar or the, 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 the original uh, person who, who fought uh, for, for uh, the uh, scientific uh, elaboration of uh, of a, a counter narrative, but built on uh, on historical facts, and that has been extremely uh, 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 important. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Pro Professor Khalidi. I mean, uh, for, for I think uh, most of you here would not even uh, need to be uh, uh, introduced. Uh, but uh, uh, let me just mention the fact that uh, actually. Uh, he he uh, started uh, working in Palestine, in the, the, the Arab office, before before the partition, and he has been also actually uh, I mean someone who has lived this whole history and and uh, uh, among the first, the very first person to 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 to, to build up a, a scientific discourse, a scholarly discourse uh, on on the issue. Uh, uh, which at the same time it was definitely uh, dedicated to the Palestinian cause, but again uh, on, on a solid uh, scientific uh, ground. And of course, uh, uh, Professor Khalidi is the, the uh, founder and director of the, 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 the Institute for P Palestine Studies. And uh, I happened to be last year in Beirut in uh, November uh, part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of uh, the founding of the, uh, the IPS, the Institute for Palestine Studies. Uh, and, uh, well, we, were, we had a panel there, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, at the same, I mean, the, the same year saw the publication of, uh, of collections of uh, uh, former articles by Professor Khalidi, both in French, and uh, in Arabic, in Arabic is in the Majallat al Dirasat al Falastaniya, the, the, the Arabic uh, the counterpart of the Journal for uh, Palestine Studies, the JPS. And in French, it's in a book series uh, uh, which is connected to the uh, IPS. And uh, well, I mean, there was 
uh, a consensus in the panel to uh, uh, to very much emphasize the the the, the, the way these articles, uh, some of them were, I mean, I think that the most, uh, um, the oldest of the articles was one published in 1959, uh, how much they, they, they still, you know, uh, stood the test of time. And this is absolutely the best uh, testimony to uh, the importance, solidity, and the quality of, uh, of, uh, of Professor Khalidi's uh, uh, research. And that's why, as I said, uh, there couldn't be any, any better person to, to, to inaugurate uh, this uh, cycle, this series of, uh, of, uh, of annual uh, lecture than uh, Professor Khalidi. So thank you very much for coming. And we very much appreciate also the, the effort of coming from all the way from Boston, where uh, uh, Professor Khalidi is established, is taught and research uh, for many years at uh, Harvard, among other uh, several places, Princeton and the rest. And uh, so we very much appreciate the, the, the effort uh, it took you to, uh, to come and, uh, and uh, join us for that. Uh, uh, before just ending this, I, 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 I would like to, to thank all those who, who made this, uh, this event uh, uh, possible, and uh, especially, once again, uh, Dr. Matar, who played a major role, and uh, Professor Izzat Darwazi, and, uh, and uh, the Qatan Foundation, which uh, uh, also help us, uh, I mean, uh, make, make this uh, possible. So many thanks to all of you, and uh, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Professor Khan. Thank you. I must first uh, thank Professor uh, Ashkar for his very generous and kind um, words about me, uh, by which I was deeply uh, touched and moved. Um, and I would like to say I salute the Center for Palestine Studies for um, the good sense of making him head of the center. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we meet today to celebrate the second anniversary of the establishment of the SOAS Center for Palestine Studies. I'm honored to have been asked to deliver this first annual lecture. It is deeply gratifying to be addressing you on this occasion in the name of a sister institution the Institute for Palestine Studies, which has just celebrated its 50th anniversary as an independent, private, non-partisan, non-profit, public service research institute. We at IPS look forward to long years of innovative cooperation between our two institutions. Like other centers of Palestine studies, we are both researching the same phenomenon, the ever-growing debris generated on that fateful day of November the 2nd, 1917, by the so-called Balfour Declaration, the single most destructive political document on the Middle East in the 20th century. How far this university has traveled and how alien the idea of a center for Palestine studies would have been to Lord Balfour can be gauged from the oft quoted words drip, dripping with Olympian disdain he uttered in 1919. Quote, the great powers are committed to Zionism. And Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes of far profounder import 
than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who inhabit that ancient land." Unquote. The expression Palestine problem is shorthand for the genesis, evolution, and fallout of the Zionist colonization of Palestine, which began in the early 1980s and is ongoing at this very hour. One century ago this year, the floodgates of World War I opened to usher the chain of events that led to the Balfour Declaration. By the time it was issued in 1917, almost 40 years had passed since the beginning of Zionist colonization and 20 since the first Zionist Congress at Basel. Despite the fervor of the early colonists, the movement of the Jewish masses fleeing Tsarist rule was not southwards towards the Levant, but westwards across Europe towards the magnetic shores of North America. A trickle arrived in Palestine, a flood rolled across the Atlantic. Most rabbinical authorities throughout the diaspora were hostile to Zionism for preempting the Messiah, while the American and European Jewish bourgeoisie were embarrassed by Zionism and fearful of Gentile charges of dual loyalty. All this changed when Britannia gave its blessing to the Zionist venture in the Balfour Declaration. Not only did it give its blessing, it also agreed to transform this unilateral declaration into a self-imposed obligation guaranteed under international law in the newly established League of Nations mandate system. Uniquely in its governance as an imperial power, it agreed to carry out this obligation in partnership with a foreign private body, the World Zionist Organization, now elevated in the guise of an international Jewish agency to an independent actor recognized by the League for the specific purpose of establishing the Jewish national home in Palestine. An immediate question leaps to mind. How, how could London, teeming with pro-consular expertise, ripened during centuries of dealings with multitudinous races and faiths across the globe. How could it have fallen for the Zionist plan? The short answer is two syllabic. Hubris. At the end of World War I, with the US withdrawn behind the wall of isolationism, and with Ottoman, Romanov, Habsburg, and Hohenzollern empires in ruins, British power was paramount. King Clovis's realm across the channel alone could challenge it. But this was no big deal, because Sir Mark Sykes had found a handy formula to win French acquiescence. Divide the loot. There is, of course, a longer answer, which is where our research centers come in. Setting aside the trees and thick foliage of the mandate periods, white papers, blue books, and commissions of inquiry, our scholars would do well to look more deeply into how and why Imperial London, between the two world wars, nurtured 
nurtured a rival imperium in, in imperio under its governance. The puzzle deepens when one considers that this imperium was not only local, it had an external dimension, an imperium ex imperio in the Jewish agency, whose major central financial institutions and other sources of power were largely American and beyond London's control. Thus, when in 1939, Ben-Gurion, the preeminent leader of the Yishuv, decided to change horses, discarding the British mount favored by his political rival, Chaim Weizmann, for an American steed. He did so in deliberate calculation of America's potential as a counterweight and successor to Britain. The story is as old as history the revolt of a client against a metropolitan patron. But the erosion of Anglo-Zionist concord by the late 1930s also illustrates an iron law of politics. No two political entities remain eternally in sync. There may be a moral here for the current relationship between Obama's Washington and Bibi's Tel Aviv. Ladies and gentlemen, the events of 1948 have stirred up more controversy than any other phase of the Palestine problem, giving rise eventually to a new post-Zionist school of historiography in Israel. Its authors have been designated as the new historians as opposed to the old historians who articulated a mythical Zionist foundational narrative. The old narrative featured a Yeshuv David facing an Arab Goliath with perfidian, perfidious Albion bent on strangling the infant state. It also involved hundreds of thousands of Palestinians leaving their homes, farms, and businesses in response to orders from their leaders to make way for the invading Arab armies on the 15th of May, 1948. Given the role of the IPS and this speaker in the articulation of the Palestinian counter-narrative, to that of the old historians, it could be useful for the record to share some elements of how, of how it developed. One of the first authoritative accounts of an early version of the Israeli orders myth is given by the Palestinian historian Arif al-Arif. Arif had been based in Ramallah as assistant district commissioner in the last days of the mandate and the Jordanians kept him on as de facto civilian governor. In mid-July 1948, Israeli forces launched a massive attack against Lidda and Ramla. While the Arab armies, a stone's throw away, stood by. The entire population of the two towns, some 60,000 people, were forced on a long trek towards Ramallah. They arrived there in pitiable condition after hundreds had dropped along the way. Count Bernadotte, the UN mediator, arrived in Ramallah the third week of July, 1948. Arif, who was delegated to accompany him, was astonished when Bernadotte told him that the senior Israeli officials he had just met had assured him that the inhabitants of Lidda and Ramallah had left because of orders given them by the town leaders. Arif immediately arranged for Bernadotte to meet these leaders, still living in caves and under bridges after the recent expulsion. Muslim and Christian ecclesiasts, municipal councillors, judges, professionals of all kinds. 
There is little doubt in my mind that this experience contributed to Bernadotte's recommendation to the United Nations on the, on the return of the refugees, which the General Assembly passed after his assassination by Yitzhak Shamir's Stern Gang. In the 1950s, the order's myth was well over the British press. By this time, the predominant Israeli version was that the orders had been broadcast by the top Palestinian leadership, not the local leaders. The most aggressive exponent of this version was the British journalist John Kimshi, then editor of the weekly Jewish Observer, the organ of the Zionist Federation in Britain. The top Palestinian leader, Haj Amin al husseini was then living in exile in Lebanon. I had known him from childhood, and he had always treated me kindly. When I described to him the impact of the order's myth in the West, he immediately allowed me unrestricted access to his archives, since destroyed by the Falangists during the Lebanese Civil War in the 1970s. I had earlier gone through reams of the BBC monitoring records of the 1948 radio, radio broadcasts kept at the British Museum in London. I added the data from Haj Amin's archives to the findings from the BBC records to produce my article, Why Did the Palestinians Leave?, which was published in 1959 by the AUB journal Middle East Forum. Enter Erskine B. Childers. Soon after the article's publication, I received in Beirut a visit from this young Irish journalist who showed great interest in the question of orders and in the BBC records. And he said to me that he intended to examine himself upon his return to London these BBC records. Enter early 1960, Ian Gilmore, owner of The Spectator, the prestigious British weekly. He had just been to Israel and had heard all about the orders from the senior Israeli officials. Having read my article in the Middle East Forum, he asked me many questions and left. On 12th of May, 1961, The Spectator published Childers' article entitled The Other Exodus, whose conclusion was no orders. There ensued a crackling correspondence of readers' letters that lasted almost three months in the columns of The Spectator, and in which, thanks to Ian Gilmore, subsequently a cabinet minister, the counter-Israeli narrative was given unprecedented exposure. An early responder was John Kimshi, who loftily opined, quote, new myths have taken place of old ones. The Israelis have contributed their share, but more lately it has been the Arab propagandists, Walid Khalidi and Erskine Childers. At the time, I was on sabbatical from the AUB at Princeton, checking the CIA records, monitoring records, of the 1948 Arab broadcasts at the Firestone Library. From there, I wrote to the spectator, disclaiming acquaintance with Childers, which was untrue, but expressing great delight that he had independently arrived at the same conclusion as myself, which was true. I also noted that my latest findings in the CIA records corroborated my earlier findings in the BBC records. No orders. As it happened, 
While at Princeton, I had also been looking at the Hebrew sources with the help of a sympathetic, elderly, Sephardic lady scholar. The result of my research was Plan Dalet, the Zionist master plan for the conquest of Palestine, soon to be published in 1961, again in the Middle East Forum. As the spectator correspondence increasingly involved the Palestinian exodus in general, I weighed in with a summary of my findings at Princeton. My letter to the spectator at the time, 1961, said the following, inter alia. A Zionist master plan called Plan Dalit for the forceful occupation of Arab areas, both within and outside the Jewish state given by the United Nations to the Zionists, was put into operation. This plan aimed at the de-Arabization of all areas under Zionist control. Plan Dalit aimed at both breaking the back of Palestinian Arab resistance and facing the United Nations, the United States, and the Arab countries with a political and military fait accompli in the shortest possible time. Hence, the massive and ruthless blows against the centers of Arab population. As Plan Dalit unfolded, and tens of thousands of Arab civilians streamed in terror into the neighboring Arab countries, Arab public opinion forced their shilly-shallying governments to send their regular armies into Palestine. I concluded by the following. It is the considered opinion of this writer that it was only the entry of the Arab armies that frustrated the more ambitious objective of Plan Dalet, which was no less than the military control of the whole of Palestine west of the Jordan. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first public mention of Plan Dalit in the West. Ladies and gentlemen, just as World War I gave birth to the Balfour Declaration, the 1967 war gave birth to another momentous document, Security Council Resolution 242. And just as the Balfour Declaration is in a sense the fountainhead of all developments in the Palestine problem and Arab-Israeli conflict in the 20th century up to and including the 1967 war, so is Security Council Resolution 242 in a sense the fountainhead of all developments in the conflict throughout the balance of the 20th century and to this day. <coughs> Oddly, Many observers look with favor on Resolution 242, largely because its preamble talks about the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. But in its operative, in its operative paragraphs, Resolution 242 does the precise opposite. True, it talks about Withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from uh, uh, ter territories occupied in the French de de ter territoires occupied. But it does not specify the time when the withdrawal should begin, the line to which Israel should withdraw, or how long the withdrawal should take place. Nor does it mention by name the territories to be withdrawn from. The resolution calls for peace and secure and recognized borders between all the protagonists, but it does not indicate who decides the security or location 
of these borders. There is no mention of the armistice lines. The resolution affirms the need for a just settlement of the refugee problem, but it does not indicate who decides the justice of the settlement or who these refugees are. The word Palestinian is totally absent, and there is no, no reference to the applicability of the Geneva Convention to the occupied territories. This remarkable text should be seen against the background of decisions taken by the Israeli cabinet on the 18th and 19th of June, soon after the hostilities ended. <clears throat> Briefly, the Israeli cabinet consensus was on one, withdrawal only on condition of peace agreements. Two, peace treaties with Egypt and Syria on the basis, basis of the international frontiers and Israel's security. Three, annexation of the Gaza Strip and four, the Jordan River as Israel's security border, implying permanent control of the West Bank. You don't have to be a cryptographer to see the concordance of the Resolution 242 with these specifications of the Israeli cabinet, or rather these instructions of the Israeli cabinet. <coughs> the focus on peace treaties with Egypt and Syria in the cabinet's uh, uh, guidelines, to the exclusion of Jordan, is of course designed to decouple, decouple these countries, Syria and Egypt, from the Palestine problem, and to isolate both the Palestinians and Jordan. On 28th of June 1967, 10 days after this cabinet meeting, Israel revealed its true intentions by annexing the 2.5 square miles of Jordanian municipal East Jerusalem, together with an additional 22.5 square miles of prime adjacent West, West Bank territory in an obscene territorial configuration sticking northwards at Ramallah. Resolution 242 was an Israeli diplomatic and political victory, no less momentous than its victory on the battlefield. But it was only possible because of President Lyndon Baines Johnson. What really motivated LBJ remains a field of study for our centers of Palestine studies. As a senator in 1956, Johnson had adamantly opposed Eisenhower's decision to force Israel to restore the status quo ante and give back territories acquired by war. In the aftermath of the 1967 war, Israel's foreign minister, Abba Iban, worked closely with LBJ's inner circle including U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Arthur Goldberg. As a member of a pre-Saddam Iraqi delegation to the United Nations General Assembly right after the war, I had to listen to Iban weaving the spider webs of his falsehoods. But I also got the chance to rebut him. Iban reveals in his memoirs that he urged his American counterparts to eradicate from their minds the very concept of armistice and to link Israeli withdrawal from the current ceasefire line, lines to peace negotiations in which boundaries would be fixed by agreement. 
This meant that the starting point for the negotiations would be the farthest foxholes reached by Israeli armor deep in Arab territory. It also meant that Israel could, as indeed it did, use the full weight of its conquests and the full weight of its military superiority to dictate the time, tempo, sequence, and extent of its withdrawal. The regime established by Resolution 242 has been, has been acquiesced in, if not abetted, by successive American administrations since Johnson's presidency. The resolution's opaqueness and permissiveness has made possible the settlement policy ongoing to this very hour. It is this regime that sent Sadat to Jerusalem and Arafat to Oslo. The 1967 war dealt the coup de grace to secular pan-Arabism already in its death, uh, death throes. But it catapulted the Palestinian guerrilla movement to the front ranks because it symbolized resistance for the entire Arab world after the humiliation of the Arab armies. But the war's most profound and potentially catastrophic impact lies in the inspiration it gave to neo-Zionist religious fundamentalist messianism and to its creation of conditions conducive to a clash over Jerusalem's holy places between Jewish and Christian evangelical jihadists on the one hand and Muslim jihadists on the other. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when one looks at the Palestinian scene today, one sees a people hanging by their fingernails to the rump of their ancestral land. In such dire straits, the topmost Palestinian priority should surely be to close ranks. This is why the Fatah Hamas rift is so scandalous. You need your two fists, your two fists to survive. Both sides are equally to blame and both sides should be tirelessly and relentlessly urged to reconcile. Of course, the very act of reconciliation between them would be pounced on by Netanyahu as an act of war. But surely Israel knows that the intra-Palestinian reconciliation is a must for any Palestinian-Israeli peace. The gap between Fatah and Hamas on the mode of struggle is wide. Abbas is committed to nonviolence. This commitment is not philosophical. As a practitioner of violence in his guerrilla days, Abbas was quietly absorbing its costs and consequences. It is no coincidence that he was the first within the Fatah leadership to propose a dialogue with sympathetic Israeli interlocutors. Abbas's commitment to nonviolence is strategy, not tactics. I know this for certain, having listened to him and to his three predecessors, Arafat, Shukeri, and Haj Amin. In many ways, Abbas is a tragic figure. He is a guerrilla leader, wittingly turned collaborationist. Every night, his security forces keep to their barracks while Israeli commando squads prowl the Kaspas and refugee camps and West Bank villages hunt hunting young militants. This is a terrible price to pay 
for moral high ground. How long can Abbas maintain this policy without real progress towards peace? How long can the Palestinians put up with his leadership? Nevertheless, it should not be forgotten that the BDS movement could not have progressed so far without Abbas. Wide though it is, the gap between Abbas and Hamas on the issue of armed struggle is not unbridgeable. There is evidence of pragmatism within the Hamas leadership. And if it thinks theologically, it can also conceive of a theological exit strategy from its declared commitment to the armed struggle. Besides, Abbas's commitment to nonviolence does not preclude civil disobedience. This could be the meeting ground once the will to reconcile takes over and the time for civil disobedience comes. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Fatah-Hamas rift is dangerously detrimental to the Palestinian cause, so is this agreement, disagreement about the political goal. It is no secret that the one state, two states issue is a major topic, topic of debate, not only within the Palestinian camp, but also within a much wider circle of allies and supporters. As you may have surmised, I'm not a congenital advocate of the partition of Palestine, the two states formula. In fact, I came to it pretty late. It was only in 1978 that I espoused it in an article in Foreign Affairs entitled Thinking the Unthinkable. I am still a two-stater, and this is why. There is global support for a two-state solution, with the possible exception of the federated states of Micronesia. <laughs> it would be irresponsible to forego this invaluable asset. We have already tried the one-state framework during the 30 years of the British mandate. And we know what happened, even though the balance of power was at first massively in favor of the Palestinians. The balance of power today is crushingly in favor of the other side. Israel is the superpower of the Arab mashrek, thanks to the rottenness of the Arab state system. In a one-state framework, Israel would have the ideal alibi to remove whatever constraints remain on settlement. Within a twinkling, the Palestinians would be lucky if they had enough land to plant onions in their back gardens and to bury their dead alongside. Israel's 1948 Declaration of Independence pledged to ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. Now, Netanyahu is insisting on prior recognition of the Jewish character of Israel as an absolute condition of a peace agreement. Of the 37 signatories of the 1948 Israeli Declaration of Independence, only one was born in Palestine. The others came mostly from Poland and the Russian Empire, from Plonsk, Poltava, Pinsk, Lodz, Kornas. These men were mostly left of center but they had not come all the way to Palestine to share their new home with its inhabitants. When Netanyahu speaks of a Jewish state, he is speaking in the name of a vast and growing 
religious fundamentalist right-wing nationalist constituency which splits Israeli Jewish society right down the middle. The division in the Jewish population of Israel today is no longer between left and right, but between the secularists and the religious. Many of the secularists are liberal, post-Zionist, but they are not in the ascendant. In the ascendant is a neo-Zionist, messianic, triumphalist, religious, right settler movement allied to the U US Christian apocalyptic evangelism fired by the 1967 conquest of the whole of Eretz Israel and the return of the Temple Mount to Jewish military possession. This coalition considers Palestinians Canaanites whose doom is biblically predestined. It does not look much more favorably on the secular Jewish leaders, uh, Israelis. There is no consensus in Israel on who is a Jew. Indeed, we should ask Bibi for a definition of Jewish. Many proponents of BDS are one-staters, looking to the success of sanctions against South Africa, uh, looking against South Africa. But between the start of sanctions against South Africa in the early 1960s and Mandela's election in 1994, there were 30 years, 30 years. This is time, time is not an asset for Palestinians in a one state framework, despite the demographic factor. <clears throat> I am not against BDS. I want it to succeed. To succeed, it needs the Jewish post-Zionists and the liberal Zionists. Delegitimize the occupation and your chances are bright. Delegitimizing Israel itself will cost you the bulk of your Jewish allies and most of the friendly world capitals. Let us have two BDS campaigns. BDS one, to end the occupation. BDS two, to implement the pledge to its Arab citizens in Israel's Declaration of Independence in that sequence. Ladies and gentlemen, to hug one's identity in an age of globalization is a global phenomenon witnessed in the breakup of states and devolution movements worldwide. The one staters run counter to this trend. A Palestinian state is a Palestinian imperative Palestinians need to maintain their own link to what is left of their own ancestral land. They need an umbilical cord to the collective memories of their parents and grandparents. They need a tribune who will stand up for those of them who will remain in their diaspora. They need to pass an inheritance to their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They need a spot under God's sun where they are not aliens, stateless ghosts, or second-class citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, just how sorry the state of the Arab nation is can be gauged from the fact that the future of Palestine hinges more on the desires and prejudices of Benjamin, Benzion, Natan, Netanyahu, than on those of any incumbent in the proud Arab capitals of Umayyad, Damascus, Abbasid, Baghdad, Ayyubid, Cairo, 
or Wahhabid Riyadh. Still, the current tripartite discourse between Netanyahu, Kerry, and Abbas is in reality a facade for the arm wrestling marathon that has been going on between Bibi and Obama for five years. I listed Bibi's parentage advisedly. His ideological template was forged by and embodied in the teachings of his grandfather, Rabbi Natan, and his father, Professor Ben Zion. Rabbi Natan, a contemporary of Herzl's, was a national religious Zionist, a rare species at the time. He was an ardent follower of Vladimir Jabotinsky, the founder of the Zionist revisionist movement, so named because from the early 1920s, it sought to revise the gradualist dissembling strategy of Wiseman and Ben-Gurion. Jabotinsky insisted on unabashed assertion of the end point of the Jewish national home, a Jewish state, through which River Jordan flowed, not one in which the river was a border. This goal was to be achieved in the shortest possible time by massive immigration, by means of an iron wall, by which he meant overwhelming military might. Ben-Gurion routinely referred to Jabotinsky as Vladimir Hitler. Ben-Zion's ardor for Jabotinsky was, not, was no less intense than Natan's. He joined the Revisionist Party at 18 and later edited a revisionist uh, daily entitled Jordan, which relentlessly criticized Wiseman and Ben-Gurion. Ben-Zion followed Jabotinsky to the United States, where he became his secretary. He stayed there for 10 years, spreading the revisionist ideology, but returned to Israel to blast Begin for the peace treaty with Egypt. Recently, not long ago, before his death, Ben-Zion told an Israeli daily that by withholding food from Arab cities, preventing education, terminating electrical power, the Arabs won't be able to exist and will run away from here. Bibi's Israeli biographers tell us that Ben Zion tutored his sons in history and Judaism, and that they held their father in holy reverence. As a boy, Bibi often wanted to discuss the two banks of Jordan principle. If Bibi's grandfather and father were his formative ideological influences, his role model in life was his older brother, Jonathan, the commander leader, the hero of Entebbe, where he was killed in action. This is where Bibi's swagger comes from. Jonathan's death traumatized father and son. To honor him, they established the Jonathan Institute in Jerusalem for the study of international terrorism. Appropriately, one of its conferences was addressed by Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Though he apparently refrained from sharing his reminiscences about Deryasin, <laughs> or about how his organization, the Irgun, had introduced the letter bomb, the parcel bomb, the barrel bomb, the market bomb, and the car bomb to the Middle East. For Bibi, the US is as much home ground as Israel. He knew the country from age seven, elementary school, high school, MIT, 
a Boston uh, consulting firm. During this period, he honed a Philadelphia accent and mastered baseball vocabulary. At least three of his uncles had emigrated to the United States where they became steel and tin tycoons. After Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon, Yitzhak Shamir, then foreign minister, sent Bibi as an attache to the Washington embassy to help repay, repair Israel's image. Bibi was an instant success, ubiquitously glib in the media, lionized by the Jewish uh, major organizations. As ambassador to the United Nations from 84 to 88, he consolidated his stardom with the uh, pro-Israeli public in the United States. In 1991, Shamir, now prime minister, made Bibi deputy minister, further feeding his Himalayan political appetite. By 93, Bibi was the Likud leader. By 96, he was prime minister. A major source of insights into the relationship between Washington and Tel Aviv is the memoirs of, and autobiographies of successive presidents and secretaries of state. The space devoted to the Arab-Israeli conflict in these writings recently has grown enormously in the recent decades. Curiously, to date, there, is, there has been no serious attempt to collate this information with the other sources one other field of study for Palestine centers. Since his Washington embassy days, Bibi has dealt in various capacities with five US administrations. He considers the American political arena as legitimately his own. He believes that his writings on terrorism convinced President Reagan to change American policy on how to deal with it. He brags that he successfully lobbied Congress to end Secretary Baker's attempts to open a dialogue with the PLO. He explains, all I did was force him, forcing Baker, into a change of policy by applying a little diplomatic pressure. That's the, that's the name of the game, unquote. On his first visit to the United States as Prime Minister in 1996, Bibi addressed Congress, receiving tumultuous jack-in-the-box bipartisan uh, ovations. A tycoon uncle whom he had invited to the session told the US newspaper that he believed his nephew could beat Bob Dole and Bill Clinton at the presidential uh, uh, race. President Clinton complained that when Bibi came to the White House for a visit, evangelist Jerry Falwell was outside rallying crowds praising the Israeli government's resistance to withdrawal from the occupied territories. Clinton believed that Bibi recoiled at heart from the peace process. His favorite tactic was to stall and filibuster. And when challenged, he would cry national insult. Enter Barack Obama. Bibi, born in 49, uh, 1949, is 12 years older. <clears throat> By the time Obama ran for the US Senate in 2003, Bibi had already been UN ambassador, leader of the Likud, prime minister, foreign minister, and was then the incumbent finance minister. It was probably only after Obama's 2004 speech at the National Democratic Convention that Obama began to loom on Bibi's political radar screen. Where on earth did this guy come from? And with that middle name? It is tempting to speculate that Bibi feels Obama impinging on Bibi's own turf. There is no time to go into the various rounds of the Obama-Bibi arms wrestling match. The settlement freeze, Iranian nuclear ambitions, 
the 1967 lines, UN recognition of the PLO, the Hamas Fatah Agreement. Some observers believe Bibi has humbled Obama. I think they are at deuce, as in Federer, um, <laughs> the other chap. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the last 100 years, since 1914, Zionism rode piggyback on Pax, first on Pax Britannica, then on Pax Americana to establish Pax Israeliana at the expense of the Palestinian people. How long can it persist in its refusal to seriously address what it has done to the Palestinians? My hunch is that Bibi will acquiesce to Kerry's framework proposals, but only with the intention to stall. He thinks he can get away with it. He sees himself as more than the Prime Minister of Israel. In 2010 and 2012, the Jerusalem Post ranked him first on a list of the world's most influential Jews. To Bibi, the Atlantic flows through Eretz Israel. <laughs> Bibi knows he will outlive Obama politically. In Israel, once a prime minister, always a prime minister. Obama has three, less than three more years to go. Meanwhile, Bibi knows he can outflank Obama in the Congress. He certainly has more bipartisan support than the incumbent in the Oval Office. All the other protagonists are committed to a peaceful resolution. Kerry is his master's voice, and Obama's understanding of the Palestine problem far surpasses that of all his predecessors. Abbas's commitment to peace is genuine. At his age, peace would be the crowning achievement of a lifetime. The Gulf dynasts are panting for a resolution. They want to focus on the real enemy, pan-Islamic anti-monarchical Tehran. Bibi will never share Jerusalem. Continued occupation and settlement while tightening the noose around East Jerusalem is a sure recipe for an apocalyptic catastrophe sooner or later over the Muslim holy places in the old city. With the continued surge in religious fundamentalist zealotry on both sides, the road to Armageddon will lead from Jerusalem. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, Benjamin Benzion Ben Natan Netanyahu is the most dangerous political leader in the world today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for this uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating lecture. And I should say, an also fascinating performance. <laughs> Quite
quite humbling to all of us teachers and public speakers who are in this, uh, in this room. And we, again, thank you very much for this big effort that you did. And this is a person who's just arrived from Boston yesterday. So, I mean, you got enough uh, food for thought for a long time, I guess. Maybe it's time for the other kind of food. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>